Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beer Smith Podcast number 58. We got a great show for you today. Dr. Charles Bamforth is joining us from the University of California at Davis. I'd like to remind you that we've got uh, beersmithrecipes.com is available, and there's over 6,000 shared recipes on that now. So a uh, nice big site, great resource for you, as well as our blog at beersmith.com slash blog, where I write articles about uh, beer brewing every week. You can enjoy that. Uh, getting very close to releasing the new mobile app for Beersmith. Uh, if that's not out already, it'll be out very shortly. I'll have information about that also at beersmith.com slash blog. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Charlie Bramforth, a professor of brewing science at the University of California at Davis. He's well, also a noted author of many books on beer brewing, including Beer is Proof God Loves Us, as well as one on soccer goalkeeping. He's been with us before. Uh, he's been a guest actually uh, three times on get episodes 31, 23, and 14. Charlie, it's fantastic to have you back on the show. Well, it's nice to be here again. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we are going to talk today a little bit about bittering substances. That was the topic you gave me. And I guess yep. you've been doing some, some work recently on hops. Well, we have. Um, we've done work uh, generally uh, related to the bittering substances, but we've done a lot of work uh, recently on hop aroma. But uh, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about uh, the bitter materials today because they have so many uh, wide uh, in impacts on beer. Mm-hmm. Well, let's start with, uh, how about alpha acids? What, what role do they play in beer? Okay, well, the alpha acids themselves um, are the origins of the bitter substances. So the alpha acids themselves are, are not uh, the bitter sub substances, and uh, they're not particularly soluble, they're not particularly bitter. But, of course, they are transformed into the iso-alpha acids, and those uh, not only provide bitterness, they also impact the, the foam and they impact the stability of the beer, and uh, they very much impact uh, the uh, the risk of light damage to the beer. So they have a number of uh, roles and functions. So uh, we have to worry about the alpha acids because uh, they're going to go on and become the iso alpha acids, and 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 those are the materials that we'll be concentrating on today. And what are what are some of those alpha acids? Can you walk us through them? Yeah, um, the, the there are three main uh, alpha acids, and they are uh, a humulone, cohumulone, and adhumulone. And um, the one that uh, most people try to breed the hops to get a low level of is cohumulone, because uh, cohumulone tends to uh, provide uh, the least bitterness and uh, the least foam stabilizing activity when it's converted into the isomerized form. So um, one of the breeding specifications for hops tends to be a low uh, cohumulone content. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us about some of the differences between, say, high alpha hops and low alpha hops? Yeah, the, the high alpha hops, of course, by the, the very name, they, they contain a lot of these alpha acids and therefore a lot of bitterness potential. Uh, the low alpha hops, the, they uh, are the opposite, and of course, uh, it's the the noble hops or the aroma hops that tend to uh, contain uh, lower levels of the alpha acids. Um, but on the other hand, they contain the prized hop aroma and perhaps somewhat higher levels of the essential oils. Um, now, some people, of course, swear by just using the aroma hops, uh, even though they're uh, providing uh, or wanting to target very high bitterness levels. And in that case, um, they obviously, there's a lot more hops per per unit of beer, if you like, or to, per barrel of beer than there is if they were to use a, a high alpha hop. Uh, so not only are they introducing high bitterness and, and high levels of the oils, they're also actually uh, introducing high levels of, of polyphenols or tannins and, is that, is that, that where the grassy flavor comes from? I know some no, people say no, if you use too much too much low alpha hops, you get you know sort of this grassy flavor. No, I think the grassy flavor is is something to do with the essential oil fraction. It, so the polyphenols are not going to provide that uh, grassiness, but they are going to uh, possibly provide an increased astringency, and uh, certainly they're going to lower the. Um, uh, haze stability of the beer, that, uh, uh, increase the risk that the beer is going to go cloudy with time. Um, on the other hand, um, some of the polyphenols are antioxidants, so it swings and roundabouts, but uh, 
The fundamental difference, high alpha hops, high level of uh, alpha acids, and a high bitterness potential. And the low alpha hops uh, usually are selected on the basis of their ability to give a nice aroma. Now, I know commercial brewers have been going towards high alpha hops for many years now, right? Especially the large ones. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense to uh, to actually uh, have a high bitterness potential so that you need to buy less hops to give a certain degree of bitterness. Um, so that certainly is the case. Um, obviously, uh, some very notable brewers use uh, uh, different hops in a single brew in that they will start off at the start of the boil with a, a high level of uh, uh, an alpha hop, a high alpha hop, uh, to provide the bitterness, and of course, the longer is the boiling, the more is the isomerization. Um, but then they will, of course, use a, an aroma hop to either late hop the the, uh, the product or to uh, to dry hop the product uh, because of the preferred uh, aroma characteristics. Now, one of the things I find interesting, though, is a lot of craft brewers are driving the other way. They're not necessarily using, well, some of them are using the high alpha hops, but a lot of them are using uh, lower alpha hops as well. Yes, of course. So they drive, but it's kind of nice because they're driving production for a while. It looked like, you know, production of low alpha hops was going to go away. Yes, heaven forbid that that would be the case. Um, Whichever way you look at it, you know, the amount of hops, even in very, very hoppy beers, compared to uh, some of the other components you get in in beer, is, is still in relatively small quantities. And, of course, um, I, I, I always sort of bemoan the fact that, uh, that the poor hop guys, I don't think they get paid enough for, uh, for the excellent products they make. So um, <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a commercial on behalf of the hop growers, and they're not paying me to say that. But no. <laughs> you, I, think, I think hop, uh, hop people deserve a little bit more um, reward for the wonderful job they do. Yeah, the other thing we've seen, I think, is the craft breweries have been driving higher quality standards in some cases. Well, I think, um, you know, the, the, the large brewers uh, and the small brewers, they're all interested in quality. So the uh, quality standards of hops are, um, are, are high and driven high. And, you know, I, I would say in fairness to the big guys that they also uh, are determined to get the highest quality products they can. Absolutely. Uh, highest quality raw materials they can. So I, I think everybody's... Uh, uh, in it together in wanting the uh, the very best in terms of quality. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about isomerization? What's that, how, what's that process? Well, yeah, as, as I said, I, well, as I said, the alpha acids um, are not particularly soluble and they're not particularly bitter. So um, what has to happen is they need to be converted into this soluble bitter form, and this is called isomerization. So the alpha acids are transformed chemically into isoalpha acids. It's, it's basically the, the molecule just changes around and, and, um, and uh, some bonds are broken and rearranged and you get a, a different uh, product, which is called an isoalpha acid. And uh, traditionally, this is uh, induced by boiling. Mm -hmm. So the, the traditional way to extract uh, the hops is... Uh, by adding them to the kettle boil. And when you boil, at the, the pHs, the relatively acid pHs that you get in wort, you get this transformation taking place in the extraction of bitterness. And it happens about 1% of the alpha acid is, is transformed every minute um, uh, in boiling wort. Hmm. Um, now... Uh, there's obviously a limit to that, right? I mean, it... Yeah, so the... At some point, it dies off, right? Well, yeah, the, you know, it's not necessarily linear through the whole time, but, right. but fundamentally, you know, if you only boil boiled for thirty minutes, uh, you are going to not get the extent of isomerization that you would if you boiled for for sixty minutes. Right now, the the isoalpha acids are still relatively insoluble. You know, they're they're soluble. Uh, to a greater extent than the alpha acids, but they're not as soluble as uh, many people would like to think that they are. So there is a limit to how much you can actually get into solution. Of course, people, we talk about bitterness units. You know, mm -hmm. I've got a bottle here somewhere up here, and it, it claims to be a thousand BU. Well, let me tell you, that's a, a gross impossibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh, well. There's it, also isn't there a flavor flavor threshold too? You can't really perceive bitterness well, beyond yeah. a certain amount, right? Well, thank goodness. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be really a marvelous thing. But, but you know, to get anything beyond 100 BU would be very, very hard. 
Um, and the other thing about the um, the bitterness substances, they they're relatively hydrophobic. That means that they tend to be lost very readily, and so they'll stick onto surfaces and they'll stick onto particles, and uh, so. Um, they're continually being lost. They'll stick onto yeast, for example. Is that, is that why I always have hops stuck at the side of my uh, pot every time I make beer? Yeah, yeah they're relatively insoluble materials, the isopropyl acids. So, so what that means is they they are lost during the process. So, what brewers talk about is is utilization, which is uh, if you you measure how much alpha acid you you're putting into the process, and you measure how much bitterness you get out in the the wort or the beer. And you measure it as a percentage. Then, for for whole hops, it's you know chances are it's going to be around thirty percent, something mm-hmm. like that. Now that sticks in the craw of many brewers. You know they they really don't like that. So um, over the years, there's been increasing um, uh, attention to how you can increase that and improve that utilization. So if you pelletize the hops, it gets a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And if you extract the hops in in carbon dioxide cold carbon dioxide and you add that liqu- in a liquid form to the kettle, that's a bit better. But you can take those liquid hops, uh, the extract of the hops, and you can do the isomerization in a factory right. use, using chemicals. And I hear you're rejecting that concept. <laughs> and, challenges, uh, challenges. Yeah, so the isomerized extracts um, uh, can then be added to the finished beer. Okay, and there are some prominent brewers uh, internationally, not especially uh, or necessarily in the United States, with one exception. Uh, but there are some that have, uh, have, for a long time now, added the bitterness right at the end into the finished beer, and that you know means that you don't lose the bitterness right the way through the process. So that's the commercial hop extract that people talk about, right? You can actually buy it on the commercial yeah, it, market, right? And that is uh, pre isomer well, some people call it pre isomerized hop extracts. In other words, somebody else has isomerized it. You don't have to put it into the boil. You can put it into the finished beer. Right. Different people have got different views about that. Some people think it uh, these beers are not quite as drinkable as uh, as beers that are made with uh, uh, the traditional ways of hopping. And you know, there's a lot of passion about how the hops should be introduced into beer. You know, it's, it's no secret that uh, uh, one of the breweries that I admire so much is uh, Sierra Nevada, and, and they insist on using whole cone hops. They, they believe it's the only way to, to introduce um, uh, hop material into beer. Um, most brewers in the world use pellets, mm-hmm. uh, but there are some that use these uh, extracts um, and have done for many years. And, you know, people drink their beer, so they must be doing something right. Now, while we're on that topic, I, you know, I get this question all the time. I, isomerization can also occur at below boiling temperature, right? Well, it, it, it can. You know, it's, it's encouraged by, uh, by that boiling process. Um, but, um, you know, it, it can certainly happen at very low temperatures if you uh, do these isomerization techniques that, that happen in hot processing factories where you're making these extracts. And so um, using a few uh, inorganic ions as catalysts and so on, you can certainly carry out the isomerization at lower temperatures. But certainly the, uh, if you are going to use whole cone hops mm-hmm. or, or pellets, uh, then the most efficient way to do it is with a nice, vigorous boil. Well, the reason I ask is because I've seen a lot of people moving towards whirlpool hops and uh, steep tops at the end of the boil, uh, you know, aromatype additions. Well, yeah, but, but of course, what we are talking primarily about there when you're talking about late addition of hops is is the um, uh, desire to retain some of the aroma characteristics, the essential. Right. If, if all the hops get put in at the start of the boil, you just drive off all that lovely hop aroma. Right. So really, the late additions are, are not so much to do with uh, bitterness. Uh, they're to do with uh, uh, aroma extraction. And of course, when you add uh, hops to the finished beer in dry hopping, uh, that is very, uh, you know, essentially uh, an exercise in extracting aroma and oils. Uh, there is sensibly no bitterness extraction at that stage. Now, what about, uh, you know, I've seen some people using Whirlpool hops exclusively even in a handful of beers. Um, for bitterness and aroma? Yeah. It depends on uh, the uh, conditions in the Whirlpool. Yeah. If it's a 
well insulated whirlpool and uh, it's it's therefore sensibly around uh, boiling temperatures, then yeah, sure, you'll get ice summarization. But uh, I really do preach um, the, the, the merits of a vigorous rolling boil, and that includes to actually um, uh, optimize the rate of ice summarization. Right. It's, uh, it's to do with good vigorous uh, volatilization, driving off of unwanted aromas, uh, particle formation, hot uh, rate. Yeah, has a number of other benefits for the beer, right? All important. So I think that, you know, um, I, I strongly advise people if they are using a traditional way of, of hopping to, to associate it with a vigorous rolling boil. Well, so after boiling, our alpha acids become uh, iso-alpha acids, as you pointed out, but there's actually more than one of these. Can you talk about the different uh, iso-alphas yeah, the, and what they contribute? So, as I said earlier on, there are three alpha acids, um, and there I summarize to produce six iso-alpha acids. Um, and uh, so each of the alpha acids, the humulone, the cohumulone, and the adhumulone, they produce uh, a two isoalpha acids. And, and these um, slightly different molecular shapes, uh, and they're called cis and trans. Um, and uh, they tend to differ in their properties. Uh, they differ in their um, bitterness. They differ in their uh, foam uh, stabilizing capabilities, and they differ in their stability because uh, the isoalpha acids do break down um, and, uh, and are converted into staling materials as well. So um, the, the, the precise balance of these six isoalpha acids will depend on what the alpha acid level is and, and which types of alpha acids you have in the hops but also they do depend on how you actually carry out the isomerization. And the balance of these things, if you uh, have a traditional boil, is different to what you have if you isomerize in a factory using the, making these uh, post-fermentation bittering materials. So, so, so that might explain some of the differences you see, I guess, between uh, using hop extract and not, right? It, it, it certainly would. If you... Uh, boil in a traditional way, then you get about two thirds the so-called cis isomer, and about one third the um, the trans isomer. But uh, depending on how you actually uh, carry out the isomerization, you can obtain uh, products that are uh, much more cis than trans. Um, and one of the things about the cis is they tend to be more bitter. So the cis isomers are more bitter than the trans isomers. So some of these hop bitterness preparations uh, are more bitter um, than um, the equivalent amount of um, isoalpha acid if you obtained it by traditional boiling. So if, to make myself clear, if you boil, you get a certain proportion of cis-trans. In some of the uh, uh, post-fermentation materials, the things you'll add to the finished product, they've got more cis than trans, and therefore molecule for molecule, they are more bitter. And that will influence the perception of your bitterness. Well, Charlie, a lot of people get to tend to get very focused about their IBU numbers, and uh, you know that's not really the whole story when you look at hops. Can you talk about that uh, that for a minute? Well, what you're measuring with the IBUs is is basically the total level of these uh, isoalpha acids. So it's it's the absolute level of them, but. You know, as I say, the 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 types of isoalpha acid uh, depend on how you actually uh, extract the bitterness. And if you extract with the the, uh, the boiling in a traditional way, you get a certain proportion of the trans and the cis isomers. But if you extract the the bitterness um, using carbon dioxide and then you you chemically transform then depending on how you do it, you can actually get more of the uh, cis as opposed to the trans, and that means it's more bitter. So the, the actual bitterness value, um, uh, the actual bitterness measurement, uh, does not necessarily correlate directly to the perceived bitterness. Um, let me explain what it, uh, the way in which you measure these bitterness units. The, the way to do it is you, you extract the beer using a, a, a solvent, mm -hmm. and then you measure the absorbance um, in the ultraviolet uh, region at uh, 275 nanometers, 
and you multiply by 50, and that gives you the bitterness unit. But if you're using some of these um, materials that you add to the finished beer to give bitterness, uh, because they are more bitter molecule for molecule, instead of using 50, you use 70. So, you know, that reflects the higher bitterness level. So, <clears throat> BUs only tells you um, a, a overall level of, uh, of bitter molecules that are there. It doesn't simply correlate always with perceived bitterness. And, of course, it tells you nothing at all about things like hop aroma. Now, does this also change with time? So, for example, if I boil, say, 60-minute edition, 30-minute edition, 10-minute edition, uh, does that change the composition of these these iso-alpha acids? No. In, in terms of a, a straightforward boiling procedure, no, yeah. you are going to be transforming, um, to a first approximation at least, all of the alpha acids at the, the same rate. So you, you, you're not going to change throughout the boil, and to any significant extent, the proportion of the, of the different iso-alpha acids. So uh, the same thing applies, the same number would apply. Uh, so, but the point is, if you are using post-fermentation bittering, uh, you do need to um, take recognition of that when you do your calculation. Uh, some brewers, if they've you know, uh, got fancy laboratories, uh, they can actually measure the bitterness in different ways, for example, using uh, liquid chromatography, and that will give them uh, a picture of all the different isoalpha acids. But, you know, that's probably overkill for most brewers. Now, you mentioned earlier in the show that the IBUs are only part of the story. The other part is really these essential oils. Can you talk for a minute about uh, essential oils and how they come into play? Well, the essential oils are, are present at typically around 2 3% uh, of the hop and very, very complicated. You know, there's probably something like 300, 350 different chemical species um, in those oils. And we can classify them according to whether they're just contain carbon and hydrogen or whether they got some oxygen in them or whether they got some sulfur in them. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a little bit known about the, the flavors of some of the individual substances, but uh, it's very, very complicated. And cumulatively, they contribute to the hop aroma. And as I said, I think earlier, you know, if you've got the nice uh, noble hops, the aroma hops, then they have a very prized uh, characteristic. I, I mean, here in the United States, we, of course, are familiar with things like Cascade with its significant grapefruit-like note, a very citrus character. Mm -hmm. Of course, all this comes from the essential oils. Um, if I was to do a fancy chromatograph and, and come up with this fancy picture looking like the Alps with all these different peaks and say, well, you know, look at that. That must be... Uh, this particular hop variety, and uh, and if we do this and we put this into beer, we'll get this sort of flavor. Uh, at this point in time, nobody can do that. There's no simple way of interpreting a, an analytical spectrum of, of the essential oils and correlate that with perceived character. It's still done in a, you know, rubbing the hops between your hands and smelling type basis. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing is that the, the the aroma of the hop itself, as judged in that way, and the aroma of the beer when you introduce that hop to it, are not necessarily um, closely related. So a hop, you know, an, an expert can tell you what the hop variety is by the you know touchy feely, smelly stuff going on. Right. Depending on you add, how, how you add it to the the beer. Um, you know, it's not the same. Uh, the characteristics of the beer will influence um, the aroma that you get from the hop. Now, obviously, if you add the, uh, the, the hops late on in the boil or during the whirlpool, this late hopping, you extract and, uh, some of the oils. They survive. They don't get boiled away. But then the yeast actually tr transforms them. There are enzymes from the yeast that... Um, uh, chemically transform some of these hop materials, changing them. And so what you get is this late hop character, which is very subtle. And because we can't simply analyze it analytically and, and recreate it in any artificial way, um, the way in which you control it has got to be with by selecting the hop variety, um, the time at which you add it, the amount in which you add it and allow it to, to, to develop that way. So it's, it's very artisanal 
rather than sort of overtly technical and scientific. And a lot of these compounds tend to boil off, right? So well, you really do, do so need to eat you you them late. Yeah, if you add the hops right at the start of the boil, you basically lose them all, especially if it's a really vigorous boil. So that's why you have the late hopping. Now, for ales, of course, traditionally we have this the concept of dry hopping. In uh, my native England, of course, adding a handful of hops to the finished barrel. And I emphasize the word handful, um, you know, not a, not a shovel load. Um, <laughs> although I have to say, I was in England last week, and I, was having, I had several pints of this nectar, and, you know, I've been in America so long now, I'm thinking, yeah, I just wish they'd put a little bit more hops in there, you know. Um, but the reality is that the dry hop character in um, uh, English ales, for example, is much less significant than it is over here. So, but over here, you know, the, the, the dry hops will be added late on. Uh, my good friends at Sierra Nevada, of course, use a torpedo. And, of course, they, they cycle the beer through the hops that are packed inside this tank called a... Kind of like a hop, hop back, right? Yeah, yeah well... Conceptually. <laughs> not really. Uh, in, to an extent, yes, but it really is basically a, a device shaped like a torpedo, which is packed with hops, and you can repeatedly pass the beer through it. So you're continually extracting the oils. Um, you know, you will extract some alpha acids, but they're not very soluble, and they're not bitter, so this is not contributing to bitterness. Um... But even then, you know, uh, although you're extracting a lot more of the hop material and although you get some of the obvious characteristics from the hop, it's still more subtle, um, if you can imagine it, than the, the whole hop itself Be because the alcohol influences things, the balance of things that get into the headspace and into your nose and so on. So it, it's quite complex. We did a study recently and we published it um, in the Journal of the American Society of Brewing Chemists. And we actually tried to develop um, a lexicon for, for hop aroma. Um, I, I, I've bemoaned the fact for years that, that people in the wine world, you know, they, they articulate very cleverly in a, almost BS, really. Well, it's definitely BS. Uh, <laughs> all, these, all these nuances of, of uh, grape varietals and so on. And uh, they're damn clever at it, and I think that brewers should do that as well. Um, and so we actually did that with a whole bunch of different hop varieties. And I don't have the, the date in front of me, um, but uh, I can certainly draw people's attention to where they can read about it. And, and therefore, you can differentiate between hops and, and give all these interesting words to define their flavor. But when we dry hopped a beer, and we actually dry hopped an extremely bland beer so that, we, you know, we, we just wanted to emphasize the hops, um, the same sorts of flavors were there, the aromas were there, but it was all compressed, all narrowed down. And so the differences between hops were not as pronounced when they were used in the beer as when you analyze the hops themselves. Um, but, you know, all of this is, is touchy-feely stuff. All of this is, you know, um, uh, all to do with, you know, perceived aromas and taste panels and so on. And it's very difficult to, to um, um, analyze uh, the oil character and the aroma character instrumentally. It's, it's a very difficult job to do, and it's still a very subjective thing. Now, you've also done some research on uh, the role of hops in stale and oxidized beer, and it, I think you found some interesting results there, right? Well, it, that wasn't specifically us, but other people have certainly been looking at the, uh, the bitterness changes in beer with time, and the reality is the bitterness goes down. So the bitterness in any beer will decrease um, with time. And I guess you could argue that uh, the more bitter beers, it's more obvious in those. Um, because proportionately you're getting a bigger decrease in the bitterness. Um, and what happens is that the, the isoalpha acids, are, do, they do degrade. And actually the trans uh, isomers, um, are, they decrease much more than the cis isomers. So um, as I said, the cis isomers are more bitter, but the trans isomers themselves do have significant bitterness. And they degrade with time, and so the bitterness goes down. And not only that, they're broken down into substances that give the sort of cardboardy, papery character as well. 
So a lot of people worry about lipids and unsaturated fatty acids as sources of staling. But, uh, you know, the reality is that the bitter substances also contribute to staling. And, uh, and, and brewers need to be mindful of that. So really, um, the higher the cis isomer, I hope this doesn't sound too complex chemically, but the higher the proportion of the cis isoalpha acids, uh, the better it is from a stability perspective. And you mentioned uh, they also play a role in the skunky flavor you get from light too, right? Oh, well, absolutely. They are the fundamental source of the, the skunky flavor. So um, beer, of course, is sensitive to light. Um, and that's why it's more stable in a can than it is in a bottle. And still psychologically, m- most people don't seem to like cans, but it's, it's bizarre. Um, and I, I, I'm in them, you know. If I'm presented with a can as opposed to a bottle in a restaurant, I, I feel shock, uh, even though the, the beer is almost certainly better because no oxygen is creeping in there and certainly no light is. Of course, any any technical brewer will tell you any color glass that you like, as long as it's brown. Um, and any marketing guy will say, yeah, you can have any color other than brown, which is not sexy. Um, but the fact is that brown traps the uh, the bulk, not all, but the bulk of the damaging light, uh, which is the low visible end and, and the high UV end. Uh, but the light gets in, it's actually captured by a vitamin, uh, riboflavin, um, one of the B vitamins, it actually captures the light and it hands it over to the isoalpha acids and, and they break down and uh, uh, the, the bit is snapped off them. It reacts with a little bit of sulfur and it produces something called MBT, mm-hmm. which uh, smells of skunk and is a very, very f- potent flavor substance. So really the reality is uh, keep the beer away from the light. This This reaction can occur very rapidly mm-hmm. and if you're sitting in a in your yard, it's nice bright sunshine outside, and you're sitting there. Um, your beer is going skunky as you sit in the yard. Depends how quickly you're drinking it, of course. So if, you're, going- if you're bottling at home, though, you'd recommend going with brown bottles, right? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Or, or at the very least, keep them out of the light uh, uh, totally. You know, Obviously, if they're, if they're hidden away uh, in, a, in a cardboard box or something, mm-hmm. see the cardboard box, then that's, uh, that's okay. But as soon as they're taken out of the there, and as soon as they start to be exposed to light, it will go skunky. Now, there is a, um, a, a way of avoiding that and still putting your beer in clear glass bottles. And it's no secret that the, the Miller Brewing Company have done this for years. And they use these so-called reduced um, iso-alpha acids. So earlier on, I talked about extracting the hops with uh, coal carbon dioxide mm-hmm. and then transforming them to produce the, the isoalpha acids. Well, Miller and one or two other people, they go an extra stage and they uh, add hydrogen uh, to these isoalpha acids and uh, produce so-called reduced isoalpha acids. And these no longer break down. They do not break down to give skunky flavors. Hmm. And uh, so you'll never get a skunky Miller in a clear glass bottle. Now, the, the thing is this, um, you don't have to have very much um, ordinary, regular isoalpha acid to be a problem. So let me, let me say this. If you had, say, two beer streams and you're making two different beers, and one of them is, is a regular uh, type beer with know, whole cone hops or something, and you're, you're going to put that into a brown glass bottle, but you had a different stream and you're going to um, be aiming to put the beer in a clear glass bottle, and you're intending to use all of these uh, reduced bitter substances, adding them to the finished beer, uh, you better keep the yeast apart. You can't use the same yeast. If you took the yeast from the regular brew and you used it to ferment the next brew that you want to be light resistant, there'll be more than enough bitterness stuck onto that yeast that will come through um, get released into the beer and make the beer go skunky. Wow. So you've got to keep regular beer, uh, the regular beer stream completely apart in every way, yeast, everything, uh, from any beer that is intended to be light resistant. It's, it's as sensitive as that. Hmm. Well, back on Podcast 23, we talked about your role as the Pope of Foam, and uh, – <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that uh, hops also plays an important role in head retention, so I thought we'd just revisit that topic. Uh, 
Yeah. And so two key components, I think I probably said before, that influence foam um, are the proteins, which come from the, the, the grain, and the bitter acids, and, and they interact. And, and so if you pour a beer out, uh, you pour it with a nice amount of foam, you don't dribble it down the side of the glass, nice vigorous pour, and if you look at the, the foam, it changes before your very eyes. It's going from being um, uh, fairly wet, it's becoming solid. And that is because the bitter acids are interacting with the proteins and cross-linking them. And, um, and that is giving you this nice stable foam, which now, when you drink the, the beer, uh, is actually going to uh, stick to the side of the beer glass and give you lacing. Um, the, um, interestingly, the trans isoalpha acids, they concentrate in the foam better than the cis ones. So although the cis ones are more bitter... It's actually the trans isomers that seem probably to get into the foam more efficiently. But they, um, they will, uh, if you don't have bitterness in the foam, uh, in the beer, then the foam invariably is less stable. Hmm. Now, just a moment ago, in terms of the light resistance, I actually measured, mentioned these reduced uh, preparations, the ones that are light resistant. They give really, really stable foams, um, particularly stable foams. Um, really solid foams. I often tell the story that a, a number of years ago I was at a well-known brewery in St. Louis and I was showing them some photographs of, of foam um, and they said, that's very interesting, why do you use Miller's beer? Uh, and they could tell, they can tell um, from the looking at the texture of the foam um, that uh, they use these uh, reduced isoalpha acids. You get a much more... Um, solid foam, a very, very solid foam, almost like a shaving cream type uh, foam mm. as opposed to one with uh, uh, finer bubbles. Interesting. Mm. Um, so what about gushing in older beers? Well, one of the, the, there are many causes of gushing. One is that, you know, somebody has shaken your beer and the solution is, you know, eliminate the friend um, yeah. some friendly way. Um and the worst cause is, is nothing to do with hops. It's all to do with the grain and, and the contamination of grain with a, a mold called fusarium. But oxidized uh, materials in hops uh, can cause beer to gush. Um, this is, it has historically been a, a particular problem with some of these um, uh, bitterness preparations that you add to the finished product, these so-called pre-isomerized extracts. Um, I'm not absolutely sure what the state of play is these days, but certainly in my days when I was research manager at Bass, we always screened every preparation uh, for its uh, tendency to cause gushing because uh, you can get in uh, older hops, but also in the isomerized preparations, uh, you can get some uh, uh, degraded hop material, some degraded resins, uh, which will actually promote gushing. So um, that's why um, you, you always do need to check um, our bitterness preparations uh, for the tendency to, uh, to, to make the beer uh, foam zoom out of the bottle, which we don't want. So how do, uh, how do hops actually protect beer from bacteria as well? Well, yeah, that's the, that's the last of the wonderful things about these bitter substances, and that is their antimicrobial. <laughs> Uh, the we can divide bacteria into the, the gram positives and, and the gram negatives. And, and what we're talking about now is the gram positives. That's the way they stain. In particular, the lactic acid bacteria, uh, which will actually you know spoil beer and make it go acid. It's sour, and, yeah. Yeah, those sort of things. Well, many of them, not all, but many of them are inhibited by the isoalpha acids, the bitter acids. And... Um, some of them are resistant. We're not absolutely sure why they are resistant, but many are inhibited. So the more bitterness, the less is the likelihood of lactic acid bacteria from spoiling the beer. The other important uh, uh, parameter is the pH. Um, the bitter acids are much more uh, antimicrobial at lower pHs. So um, the lower the pH of the beer, the more stable it is, um, to bacteria for two reasons. One is um, that the acid itself tends to inhibit many organisms, but also at the lower the pH, the bitterness is in the form which is able to inhibit these bacteria. 
So you're talking about pH of the overall beer, the finished beer, not pH in the mash or anything like that, right? So uh, if, for example, your beer is at uh, pH 4.5, then it is less uh, resistant to uh, contamination with lactic acid bacteria than it would be if it was pH 4. Mm -hmm. So pH 4 is more stable uh, microbially than at pH 4.5. Having said that, uh, beer stales more quickly, it goes oxidized more quickly at pH 4 than it does at pH 4.5. So trade-offs. You, you've got to choose what your risk is, you know. <laughs> well, uh, Charlie, I was wondering if you could share some thoughts about how uh, homebrewers might apply all this to, you know, focus on, on making better use of their hops and also getting, you know, maybe getting beyond just IBU counting, thinking about the total profile here. Yeah, well, I think we've talked about a number of things that uh, that, that homebrewers should be mindful of. I think they need to be mindful of, of the hop variety um, from the context of, of course, the type of uh, oil component has and the nature of that oil, but also in terms of the, the types of the alpha acids that they've got in there. Um, and I don't have a list in front of me of the, the relative proportion of humulone, cohumulone, and adhumulone in different hops. But I do think they, uh, they need to um, uh, recognize that uh, it will influence uh, the perception of bitterness that they're going to be getting. Um, if, you have, um, if you're going to have the isocohumulones, they are less bitter um, than the isohumulones and the isoadhumulones. Mm -hmm. So the way in which you can influence that uh, is to sort of be making sure you're choosing hops with a low cohumulone content. Now, it may be, for many people, overkill, quite honestly, um, to, to actually start worrying about that sort of thing. The much more important thing is that if they're using hops, they look after them. Um, the... The hops need to be uh, airtight, stored airtight for as, as, as much as, as long as they're used, uh, being used, and uh, stored cold as well. Yeah, and, uh, and you're not talking about putting them in a Ziploc bag, right? No, I'm certainly not doing that, no, no. <laughs> because if you're not careful, the next time you open that Ziploc bag, you smell it, you've got cheese. Yeah, they're perme Ziploc bags are air permeable, so the air gets, still gets in. Yeah, so the alpha acids are... Um, uh, they will break down to give a cheesy character, and uh, and there's nothing worse than than having uh, uh, this characteristic, which you know you're going to be introducing into your product. So the hops need to be as fresh as possible, and and stored away from air and stored in the cold uh, for the duration. Uh, and um, you know that is much more important than anything else. I would suggest uh, that, that that the home brewer can do. Um, so, so, so my recommendation is to treat them with respect and, and realize, also recognize that you can sort of play tunes. You can, you can separate the control of the bitterness uh, then from the control of the aroma uh, in the ways that I've described. Mm -hmm. So, Charlie, can you tell us about some of the new projects you're working on? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the midst of a six-part series for the American Society of Brewing Chemists, um, all about the troubleshooting guides, really, uh, just like you have in a car manual, all to do with different aspects of quality. The first one is already published. It's all about foam. But the one that we're uh, putting to bed right now, I've finished it, and now it's uh, being produced for publication, is, is all about flavor, including bitterness and uh, hop aroma and, and so on. So hopefully that will be out in a few months' time. And uh, you, you can, if you go to the uh, website of uh, the American Society of Brewing Chemists and go to the bookstore there, you can, uh, you, you can get into it. The next one is going to be about flavor stability. So um, that's, uh, that's going to be all about keeping the beer fresh. So do you have some of the titles for us? Well, as I say, the, next, the first one was foam. This one is beer flavor. Uh, the third one will be flavor stability. Uh, the fourth one is all going to be about beer appearance, color, and uh, haze, and so on. The fifth is all going to be about uh, uh, actually the health of all aspects of beer, and the safety and wholesomeness. And the fifth, uh, the sixth, will be a general book all about principles of quality and you know laboratories and setting up quality systems and all that sort of thing. 
and you can purchase all, all those at the ASBC website. Right? Yeah, they're, they're all being, I mean, the first one is there already. The next one will be uh, in the marketplace pretty soon, but I'm still working on sequentially on the other four. So it'll be a, over the next three or four years. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, Charlie? Um, no, I'm, the other thing I think that, that is possibly worth mentioning, and it's, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to come up with any evidence for it, but I think hops benefit the human being from a health perspective. Um, and now you can, you could argue that health, uh, directly in terms of the fact that they do contain, uh, antioxidants and so on. That's, that's relevant. Actually, we did a study and we found that, uh, hops do contribute to the silica in beer, and that, that's, good for the bones as well but there's a lot more silicon comes from the grain but you know it's no secret that the uh, closest relative of the hop is marijuana and uh, (laughs) there's a lot of people who actually believe um, with some degree of justification um, that um, there is definitely health reasons for why you might want to legalize the use of marijuana now hop is the closest relative now, uh, this is not a, uh, an exercise in advocating for uh, a release of any legislation. But the point I'm making is um, that many people feel hops have got a nice soporific sort of mellowing quality. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, it's an interesting area, I think. Um, where well, I, know, I know a lot of people make hop teas and other things like that uh, you so, know, for health the, reasons. The, yeah. And and I I think I I don't want to pe- start people sort of saying whoa whoa now let's be careful you know um, and start legislating against hops for goodness sake um, but I I'm just curious about some of the mellowing uh, influences of hops and the beneficial aspects uh, to uh, to a lifestyle um, and a you know a, a, you know chilling out and and I, I'm firmly convinced that the, the, there is potential interest in this area and, uh, and advocating for uh, a good hop aroma uh, from a perspective of, uh, of mellowness. Well, I think a lot of us enjoy a good uh, mellow beer at the end of the day, so I think that's uh, very appropriate advice. <laughs> I hope it's a, hopefully it's not too much BS, but anyway, I hear. <laughs> well, thank you. I, yeah, it's always always good to have you on, Charlie. I really appreciate you being on the show. And um, again, today my guest was uh, Dr. Charles Bamforth. He's a professor of brewing science at the University of California at Davis. And uh, thank you again for joining us, Charlie. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to Charlie Bamforth for appearing on the show. Always enjoy having him here. A uh, reminder to you, if you would like feedback for the show, you can leave it for us at beersmith.com slash blog under this particular episode. And you can also find all of our episodes there if you're looking for some of the older episodes. Uh, also, another reminder, if you'd like to hear get our newsletter, you can go to beersmith.com and just fill in your email address in the little box on the right side, and we'll send you an article on homebrewing every single week. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.